Hello and welcome. I'm David Greenberg. I'm the founder and creator of freedomvibe.art. And today I have a very special presentation for you. I'm calling this one, Knowing Your Rights, a most valuable lesson. And this will definitely be something very valuable for you as long as you're willing to spend the time it takes to watch this and pay attention so that you can really absorb these powerful teachings. So having said that, let's dive right in. Why is this an important topic? Well, let me ask you a different question. Have you ever tended to a garden? Did you ever grow any fruits and vegetables or maybe even just a decorative garden? Did you notice what would happen if you left the garden unattended over time? Eventually, of course, the weeds would take over. Well, in a similar manner, if we don't tend to protect and defend our rights, then evil, which is the opposite of freedom, through the mechanism of authority and culture, is going to come and attempt to take away our rights. And actually, even worse, it's going to get us to basically give up our rights. So they do require defense, just like a garden requires someone to take out the weeds. Another issue, though, maybe even a more pressing problem, is that most people can't even explain what rights actually are. They can't give you the actual definition. And you can put this to the test. You can ask people. People throw around the word rights a lot. They use, they use and mention rights a lot, especially in certain contexts. But most people can't even give you the correct definition of what a right is. And I'm going to help you with that today on this video. Freedom, and I'm going to go out on a limb here and assume that if you're watching this, freedom is important for you. Well, the truth is freedom is not possible unless we can understand and exercise our rights. So. Sadly, not a lot of people are doing what I'm doing. There isn't a lot of great content out there. Yes, there is content about rights, and if you do a search, you will find some other videos, but uh, many of them are tackling rights from a geopolitical perspective and not from the perspective of how rights actually are in nature. So I'm going to address that on today's presentation. So where do rights come from? Where do rights actually come from? Well, the truth is that you are already free. You are naturally born free. You're born free and sovereign. You already are free. You own yourself. You don't need anyone's permission to be free. You don't need anyone's permission to exercise your free will. You already have that. That's an inherent right that you have. So there is no piece of paper. There is no government declaration. There is no... Um, man-made law that is required or even necessary for you to have to be free and to have rights okay so all the rights that you have they're built into nature and the fact that you have them is built into nature it's not a man-made process so you were born with your rights and you can enjoy them your entire life provided that you understand what they are and how they work and you abide by very simple rules that we're going to talk about in this video. So why do you have rights? Why, why is this even necessary? Well, again, you have infinite value as a human being. Your soul has infinite value. You are a being that has the potential to manifest anything. Right? You have infinite creative ability you can tap into the creative abilities of the spirit world, of what some people have called higher consciousness or infinite intelligence. And you express this value, you express your value as a human being through your actions, by what you do in your lifetime. Well, there needs to be a mechanism in place to maximize your potential for growth and learning so that when you behave a certain way, you can create, you can expand you can grow yourself and you can also help to make to create better and greater realities so those are the spiritual laws 
and they actually exist for that benefit. Um, and there, the spiritual laws are what enforces rights, as we're going to talk about as we move forward. But without those rights, it would be impossible to learn and grow. Things would just be this giant soup of chaos, and uh, you know, it could be a losing battle. There would be no structure, no framework to allow for maximum benefit based on your learning and evolution. So that's why we have rights, and that's why they're so, so important. In order to talk about rights, we need to talk about rightful possession and property. It's very important because it's inextricably linked with rights. So what is your property? It's anything that you own. You own it. As it turns out, your life is your property. So is your mind and your body. Your free will, when you exercise it, is also your property. It's a gift from creation to you, and I have it too, and so does every living being. And you are free to use it. We can say that you own something, it's your property, as long as you didn't acquire it through violence or causing harm, meaning you didn't steal it from someone. You didn't, you didn't act an act of violence in order to acquire it. It's also important that you are currently controlling its usage and that you are 100% responsible for any consequences that come out of using that property. So when we talk about rights, Really, there's an expression, all rights are property rights. And as we're going to see as we move forward in this presentation, that's actually very true. So what is a right? We've kind of laid a little bit of foundation. Now we can dive into an actual definition of what a right is. A right is anything you can do, any action or behavior that does not steal someone else's property. That's what a right is. Anything you can do that does not steal somebody else's property. So how is this enforced? How do we actually enforce rights? Well, reality has a mechanism built in to enforce rights and to maximize the learning. Because again, we have free will, which means we can even do the wrong thing. But there is a mechanism in place in nature that helps us learn right from wrong and understand the consequences of those choices. And that's called natural law. And natural law is a big part of what I teach on this platform. So if you've already watched any of my other content, you've almost certainly run into this concept. It may be new to you. I'm not gonna go into deep into natural law in this particular presentation, but I'm gonna at least make mention of it. So natural law is the inherent to nature mechanism, the, the operating conditions that allow us to learn and understand the difference between right and wrong and experience benefits from choosing, from making the right choice. So that means that there is a direct positive correlation between rightful behavior, what we call morality, and freedom. So the more we behave rightly in the aggregate, meaning all of us together, the combination of all our individual choices, the more we live, the more of a free society or free world we live in, and vice versa. The less the more we ignore or go against morality, the more enslaved we, ex we are and the more suffering we experience. And that is by nature, that is by design. So how do we participate in this process? If, there is this, uh, if there are these laws or principles in nature that are controlling the consequences, what is our free will aspect of it? What, what part do we contribute? Well, it's very simple. We get to make the choices. We get to choose every time we, we act or behave, every single time. And when we make better choices over time, we get better outcomes. It's really that simple. And it will be of one's nature. So if you're someone that, that you desire to seek truth and understand what is true, and when you have self-respect and respect for others, it's just going to be natural for you to not only take advantage of your rights, but also defend and protect them. It will, that will arise naturally out of that respect for self and others. So again, I'm not going to go deep into natural law because I've, I've talked about it in other presentations and there are other resources to dive in. But just in terms of this conversation, natural law refers to spiritual laws or principles, if you prefer, which are inherent in nature. These are um, dynamics, 
that are basically governing the consequences of our choices of behavior individually, but for the most part, manifesting in the aggregate collectively. So natural law is also a discoverable science. It's not something that's hidden in a way for, that you can never learn it or that it is so esoteric that you could never understand it. It's actually very practical. It's very easy to understand um, and it's discoverable. You can put it to practice in your own life in the microcosm of your own life and you can start to see how your choices are affecting your own journey and then in the aggregate we can learn together how we are co-creating this reality based on our collective choices and how we can make the world a better place through our collective efforts to make better choices. So, and that comes from basically knowing that natural law exists, understanding to the greatest extent possible how it works, what its mechanisms are, and then basically aligning our behaviors with those mechanisms. And that creates the outcome. So let's talk more about the nature of rights. Again, rights are natural, they're inherent, it's something that's built into reality. It's not something that we needed to construct. So um, that means they're not granted by other human beings. There is no body of any kind, there's no individual, there's no king, there's no oligarchy, there's no government, um, no document issued by any group of people that can even grant rights. All they can do is basically echo back what is already true naturally or contradict it. That's really all that these man-made documents can do and that's all that anybody can do when they claim to confer rights. They're simply, they're simply pretending to confer something that already was granted, right? It's a nonsense, it's nonsense. Rights can't ever be taken away. You have these rights, but if you, they can fall into, uh, if you become ignorant or if you remain ignorant of them, which most people are, then you'll never really be able to take advantage of them. So in a way they're kind of um, atrophied. Um, they can also be actively suppressed and you can actually forfeit your rights um, if you make the wrong choices. The other thing to keep in mind is that rights only apply to actions and behaviors. They do not apply to thoughts and feelings, for example. They don't apply to your inner world. Yes, you can have thoughts and feelings that could, if acted on a certain way, could potentially lead to harmful or wrongful action. That is possible. But you can't really stop thoughts and feelings all you can do is experience them and then make good choices based on the thoughts and feelings you have. So if you have a dark thought, a thought about doing something harmful, yes, you had the thought, that's, un that's un undeniable, but that doesn't mean you have to act on that thought. And you may have a different relationship with it or you may integrate it in a different way that doesn't require you to actually act on it. We don't just have to act on every thought uh, uh, that we have or any feeling, we can actually start to modify and refine our actions, right? So really, rights only apply to the things that we actually do and operating on physical reality. Rights also only apply to individuals. This is a big mistake that a lot of people make when they use the term right to think that there's collective or group rights. No such thing exists. It's, it's a fiction. There is no group rights because there's nothing that can be said to be right to a group of people if it isn't already right for an, any individual. Right? And since we already all have the same infinite rights, there is no distinction between groups. At group A, no matter what their skin color is, their gender, their background, their cultural upbringing, whatever other factors, um, has no bearing on their rights. This group will have the same infinite rights as that group over here, right? under all conditions. It's also to understand that rights are definitive and objective. What that means is violence and harm, theft, is always wrong 100% of the time. There are no exceptions. There's no you know, cases where it can be forgiven or, or condoned. It's always wrong all of the time. It's definitive. And, be, and rights must be defended. They must be defended and protected as we've mentioned. Defended against whom actually, or what? Well, unless you've been living under a rock, you've probably recognized that in our world, there is manifest uh, agents that claim to be external authority, meaning they claim to rule over us. Um, they manifest mainly as government. In the past, they may have manifested as kings. Sometimes they manifest as other institutions, law enforcement as the enforcement wing of, of authority. 
And all these institutions, they do the same thing. They basically tell you that you're worth less than the institution, you're worth less than the law, and therefore they limit your, attempt to limit your rights, to control them, and even to take them away from you, or to more, you know, more accurately to get you to consent to giving up and not acting on your rights. That's really how it works. And culture, which is a big agent of authority, which includes nations, um, these artificial constructs that you belong to a certain group just because of where you were born, patriotism and religion, among others, these are all cultural paradigms. All they do is they teach you again that you have less value than authority, that you need to be ruled over someone because you're not a good being, and uh, you have to give up your rights in order to live freely, in quotation marks, in society. So this is what this is what you're up against. This is what you are up against and what I'm up against. And they use authority, uses mind control to actually get you to think inside your own mind to, to convince yourself that you don't have these rights, that, that you are less valuable. So we can call that the enemy within. And mind control is absolutely necessary because they've got to, because all of reality creation starts with the mind and they've got to get you to think that way in order to act in a way that is against your rights. So that is whom and what we are defending ourselves against and defending our rights against. Rights are closely related to morality. It's, it's essentially an expression of morality. Morality is that objective science of behavioral consequence. Again, morality exists because natural law is basically enabling or it's basically facilitating morality and consequence in our reality. So you are capable of holistic intelligence. You are capable of intellect and logical thinking, but you're also, you're also intuitive and you can tap into what's called your sixth sense or your common sense or your inner knowing. So you have that inner, you have that capability of holistic intelligence and self-reflection. So what that means is you can and do know the difference between right and wrong. You don't need me to dictate or anyone to dictate to you what is the difference between right and wrong. Yes, it's helpful to have lessons like these because it reinforces concepts and it brings clarity, but you already can tell the difference between right and wrong inherently. The only exception is someone who is a psychopath who, or who is lacking emotional empathy and affect and cannot feel emotions in the body to a large extent or, to, or completely will, be, will largely be unable to do this uh, holistically because part of holistic intelligence is feeling the emotions that tell you if this is right or wrong. Emotions like uh, inhibition or fear or shame or guilt or regret, things like that, remorse. So if you can't feel any of those emotions, you don't really have a way to intuitively understand right or wrong. You can only understand it intellectually, but that, that really isn't enough to understand it. It's not an intellectual exercise. It's a holistic exercise. It's intellect and logic and that inner knowing. So you can and do know when rights are, when, act, when behaviors are right or wrong, you know it already. Um, and you, and this, lesson is just to reinforce that. By the same token, you must defend yourself by, for any, against any threats of violence, whether they come from other beings or from some force in nature. You have to defend yourself, right? And the extent to which you have self-reflection, you correct your behaviors, and you take the right actions and defend yourself, the degree to which you do all that is essentially the degree to which you are a moral being, and that is, is the degree to which you, and by extension, everybody in the shared reality becomes more free. So another way to think about rights is, I don't owe you anything. I don't owe you anything. The only thing I owe you is to leave you in peace and not cause harm to you, right? And you to me is the same thing. The only thing you owe me is to leave me in peace and not cause harm. If we voluntarily agree to do something specific between the two of us, that's great, but that comes from voluntary choice, not through violence and coercion. So the next question is, how can we preserve our rights? How, how does one go about preserving these rights? So as I mentioned, this should probably be pretty clear by now, there are requirements in order to keep our rights. They're not automatically guaranteed. They, we do have them. They are our birthright. They're there for us to take advantage of 
but they're not automatically protected, shall we say. They're not automatically preserved or conserved. We have to do things, right? So the most important thing, if you're just starting, in order to keep and maintain your rights is to basically commit yourself to understanding, to learning and understanding natural law and objective morality, right? The concepts of which I've talked about on this video and pretty much on all of my content. So you want to become a student of natural law, a student of this occult knowledge, and it is occult knowledge, it's generally hidden, it hasn't been widely taught. Um, and you want to make that a lifetime practice. You want to keep going back and deepening your understanding. So this, this particular lesson might be one of many lessons that you endeavor to learn and put into practice in your life in order to make this more natural for you, right? Self-ownership is very important. You already own yourself, but you have to act in a way that you recognize and respect the fact that you own yourself and, and act accordingly. So you have to put that, you have to activate your self-ownership. Similarly, it is going to require courage. The reason why preserving rights requires courage is because, as we've mentioned a number of times, there are forces in the world, we can just call it all under one umbrella, call it evil. Evil is always going to attempt to take away your rights or convince you to abdicate your rights. So because that courage is always acting upon you with lesser, sorry, because those, that evil is always acting upon you with lesser or greater force, it's going to take courage and activation of your will to, take, to do the right thing, to take the right actions to defend yourself. Defending yourself may be as simple as standing up and saying no. Oftentimes, just saying no is, is enough in many cases to put a stop to something. But you may sometimes need the courage to do more, including to apply force in order to defend yourself, in order to protect your life, defend your body, and your rights. And, of course, this information is going to be largely useless and not really helpful unless more people understand it. That's why I'm teaching this to you right now, and that's why once you understand it, you can go off and teach it to others. You don't necessarily have to use the same words or do it in the same way that I am, as long as you're teaching the same principles. You could teach it, you could do a lecture, a presentation, you could do poetry, music, art, uh, film, documentaries. There's many different formats. It's all, they're all valid. The, the main thing is that once you understand it and apply this in your own life, you need to teach it to others because the only way that, that rights can actually be preserved is if the majority of people know what rights are, they understand the mechanisms that give us rights and, and maintain them, and they act accordingly. That's really the only way. So what are some examples of right and wrong behaviors? Um, this is going to be somewhat review for some people. Um, and as I mentioned these behaviors, check with your inner knowing. It should be readily apparent with your inner standing that, that you can already identify when something is right or wrong. So go ahead and check that. So examples of rights, um, the right to choose your actions and behavior. In other words, to act on your free will. The right to travel freely, as long as you're not trespassing in someone's private abode. The right to consume any food or really any substance that you want to put into your body. The right to defend yourself. And the right to acquire new property, either through origination or exchange. Origination just refers to the fact that you went to the raw materials in nature of something that had not been claimed or as owned by anyone else, and you act upon it. You, put, you apply your own workforce to it, to acquire it, and to take, to take ownership of it and perhaps to fashion it into something. Exchange is just when there's already existing property and you exchange it with other people, right? But either way, it's all voluntary and it's all right and moral. Now, you probably have figured out by now that we have infinite rights. You have infinite rights. So there's no way we could ever list them all out or count them. There wouldn't be enough time in the universe to do that. And that's actually really good news. That's really, really good news. You have infinite rights. I have the same infinite rights that you do. And any person that you find in the world 
has the same infinite rights that you do and that I do. In contrast, here are some examples of behaviors that are always wrong. They're never right. They're always wrong all of the time. Murder, which is the wrongful theft of someone's life. You went and stole someone's life. There was no, you weren't defending yourself. Uh, you basically initiated that force against them and you murdered them. That is always wrong. Rape, by the same notion, because it's theft of free will choice of, that the person has with whom they wish to intimately associate. Assault is the theft of one's well-being in their body. So you're causing harm to their actual physical body and you're acting upon their body with, against their, their will. Theft of physical possessions is a ubiquitous and common form of wrongdoing. Trespassing basically is the theft of privacy and safety in one's private abode. Coercion is the theft of someone's free will choice. So you are applying pressure to that person using a threat of violence and punishment to get them to act in a certain way. We can recognize this, and we'll, we'll be talking more about this in a second, but you can recognize that this is very, very common. This is the main method that, through which authority, evil through authority and culture, gets people to behave as per its will and instead of as per the will of the individual. So coercion is also wrong all the time, 100% of the time. And deception, which is the taking away of the being's ability to make the right choice because you've withheld important information. In case you haven't been paying attention, this reality is basically set up to always challenge your rights at all time. It's almost like the reality is putting you to the test to make sure you're really up to it. Are you really up to it? Do you really want to exercise these rights? Do you really want to be free? That's essentially what's happening. So you can expect that through your whole lifetime and through any incarnation in this reality, then you're going to, have your, you're going to be tested in this way and you can expect to have your rights challenged. Because of that, if you truly want to keep and exercise your rights, self-defense is a requirement. It's also a right but it's also a, we could say it's a requirement uh, to defend yourself, including using physical force, including in some cases, excessive force or a large amount of force. It's not violence because violence is always wrong. Violence is the initiation of force. When you apply self-defense, there's already violence. Somebody is already attacking you. They may be assaulting you. They may be attempting to assault you, for example. There's already violence. There's no going back. We've already passed the point of no return as far as violence being initiated. So now you're going to simply take your force and put a stop to it. That is not adding more violence. That is attempting to stop the violence. And that is the force of self-defense. And that is always right and always moral. The wrong force is the violent force which initiates harm. Unprovoked, unwarranted, unrightfully, wrongfully. That is violence. The self-defense is your birthright and your obligation. Let's talk about justification. You, you may be thinking or maybe wondering, how is it that evil through authority and uh, culture is so wildly successful in getting, literally getting people to harm other people, to violate natural law, to uh, trample all over each other's rights, and essentially to give up their own rights. How, how is this possible? Well, there is a force, there is a concept, I should say, called justification. Justification comes from the Latin, the etymology, literally the, the, the etymological meaning is to make right, to make right, or to make into a right. So basically, justification is a claim that if there's a wrong action, it's actually right. So it's an inversion. Or if there's a right action, it's actually wrong. And it, usually, it goes both ways. Probably more times than not, it's uh, claiming that wrongs are rights, but it also is claiming that rights are wrongs. For example, you're not allowed to smoke that particular substance. You're not allowed to um, carry a, a, an arm, arms to defend yourself in certain places. Um, so these are examples of justification, right? These 
always require some degree of deception. The difference or the nuance is whether the person who is justifying is lying to themselves principally and trying basically lying to themselves in order to get themselves to believe something that's not true. Or is it simply a matter of them knowing that it's wrong, but they're actively lying to others, deceiving others, or is it some combination? That's really all the, that that's really the dynamic, but there is some form of deception going on, whether to self or others. Because again, you know the difference between right and wrong. All you can do is lie to yourself about it. You can't actually make it different. You can only tell yourself a lie that goes against what is actually true. So evil as authority, as manifested authority as government, law enforcement, and so forth, always uses justification as an excuse for their actions. So they normalize violence and aggression through justification. They justify it. It is necessary. And they say it is necessary because, and then the lies basically come after that. All the bullshit, all the incorrect reasons and excuses, um, the ideologies um, that's all based on lies and deception, that all ensues in order to justify this violence, right? That's, that's pretty much how, how authority works. Individuals, the ego, which is the part, the more of the base level of the consciousness, the fight or flight survival, um, the self-identity, um, the ego will justify things in its own mentation, in our own minds, in order to allow us to do the wrong thing because people do act wrongfully and they, people do, do have, unless they're psychopaths, which is, you know, born psychopaths is a very small percentage of the population, but anyone who's not, not like that, who, who does have the capacity for holistic intelligence, um, they need to suppress that moral compass and the ego needs to justify in their mind, in their mentation, in their thinking, that why they're, why that wrong act is in fact a right when it, when it is no such thing. So that's the ego justifying to oneself. Yes, it's okay to go and uh, murder this person because I'm a soldier and I'm defending my country, for example. Like the ego will just tell any crazy story to, um, or it's okay for me as a police officer to assault this uh, woman and throw her to the ground, this 80 year old woman, because I am defending the law and she's violating the law. Right, she's against the law, so um, it's the the mind will justify it every single time. It's also important to note that justification is not the same thing as rectification, where we are attempting to right to to correct an imbalance that has been caused through a previously committed wrong action. That's something different, and I'll mention a little more about that in a second. Many people are paid to commit wrongs and violate natural law. This is how, again, a way that authority, that evil through its different institutions of authority, which include not only government, but also mainstream education, the media, law enforcement, the, the legal system, judicial system, and other institutions as well, religious institutions. So many people who belong to these institutions are actually paid to commit wrongs and to violate natural law and the rights of others. We'll, we'll talk a little more about specific examples in a second. It's important to understand that their ego is, the way they're able to get away with this is that they're, they're lying to themselves and they're justifying that those actions that because they have some fear. They have some fear and they're acting as though it's, it's what they need to do to survive, right? It's a very base level of consciousness. So it's really incredible how much of our civilization is made out of people who, who they'll accept a paycheck. As long as you give them a paycheck, they will trample all over your rights. They will spit on your rights. They'll trample over them. They'll, they'll claim that you don't have them and they'll try to convince you to give them up. So it's just, it's just amazing when you think about it. In order for you to do the right thing, you have to follow conscience. You have to follow that inner knowing of the difference between right and wrong. It, it can't be an intellectual exercise. It can't be because someone told you or because someone threatened to punish you if you didn't act a certain way. Nope. 
The only way you can actually do the right thing is to do it of your own free will by following your conscience and identifying if it's right or wrong and then acting accordingly. That's it. That's the only way that you can do the right thing. So having said that and thinking about in the context of society, what would be some examples of right livelihood? So right livelihood simply means that you're engaged in a profession because we, as human beings, we do that. We engage in professions so that we can create and work together and create communities and build and grow. So what are some examples of rightful, right livelihood or professions that are, that are good? As long as there are no exceptions to, to acting wrongly within the context of that profession. So examples, there's an infinite number of examples, of course, but just to name a few, engineering, being a private teacher, an instructor or a tutor, not affiliated with mainstream, uh, not affiliated with the mainstream education system that is created and maintained by authority, but just being a private educator like myself. Uh, being a bodyguard or a private security guard, a business owner, a coach or a consultant, that's also a hat that I wear, a tour guide, a scientist or researcher, an architect, an artist, I consider myself an artist by profession as well, and a chef or a cook. So that's just a, a small, relatively small list of the certainly almost infinite number of uh, jobs or professions, I would say, not really jobs, but professions, undertakings that someone can do, someone can work in that are right, that they are based on right behavior and uh, not, they aren't, you know, while they can be used the wrong way, while people can act wrongly within those professions, as long as one does act rightly, there's nothing wrong with being in that profession. It's good, it's good by nature. In contrast, there are professions that from their very nature, from the essence of what they are, they're always wrong. They're always wrong because they utilize violence, they implement violence and harm, or they institutionalize it, and or they condone it, or require some kind of theft of property in order to operate, right? So these professions are always going to be wrong 100% of the time. They're never right. This includes politicians, lawmakers, and government officials. Anyone that is associated with government, because you didn't consent to government, you didn't consent to be governed by them, neither did I, and as long as even one person doesn't agree to be governed and does not have the right to, does not have the ability to opt out of, of being under their, uh, under the influence of the government and being threatened for punishment, for not obeying, then it's immoral. It's wrong all of the time. Uh, police and law enforcers are the ones who actually go out and inflict violence on people for not obeying. So they are the direct hands of violence. Soldiers and military officers are often sent to other parts of the world where people are just minding their own business and they literally murder and assault and rape and destroy and steal property and, and pillage other parts of the world. So almost almost way to spread evil to more places. These are not noble professions by any stretch. They are the opposite. They are immoral professions and wrong. Corporate news anchors and reporters that are part of the so-called mainstream media, which is a consolidated, centrally controlled media, just a very few corporations and individuals are in charge of it. Um, and they're basically paid liars. They're paid liars, they're paid to deceive, it's all based on immorality because they, they fabricate all this nonsense. And if the last three years or so hasn't been direct evidence of how, how wildly successful they are doing that, then I don't know what to tell you. It's like blatantly obvious now just how much of, how much of a paid liars they are. Uh, so that is never right. That's not to say that if one is an independent journalist not affiliated with any of those institutions and is trying to uncover the truth, Yes, that would be moral, but I'm talking about corporate anchors and members of reporters who work for the system, for authority. Attorneys and judges. 
Attorneys can be great thieves. Think about wrongful lawsuits. Attorneys and judges, great at stealing people's rights and property. Tax accountants, although they're not the ones who levy the immoral and wrongful theft by extortion that is known as taxes, um, they facilitate it. They condone it and facilitate it, and they actually, even worse, they get paid as a benefit when that continues. So complete wrong livelihood. Bankers and money lenders, because they are actively engaged in deception to dupe people to giving up their rightful property uh, through usury, basically, through a wrongful claim of ownership over things that do not belong to them, and through manipulation. So always wrongful. So the only thing that anyone else can rightfully demand from you is simply to respect them, to respect them and their property. Don't cause harm. Don't bother them if they don't want to be bothered. Leave them in peace. Engage, interact with them only on a voluntary basis. Nothing coerced, right? That's the only thing that anyone else can ever command of you because that is their natural right for you not to harm them. So they are in their right to demand that, but that's the only thing they can actually demand of you. Everything else has to be from through voluntary agreement, period, the end. We all have the capacity to develop and cultivate a moral filter. Why is this important? Well, if you're going to attempt to act rightly as much as possible, you are going to have to weigh each choice of behavior that you make. And at first that might seem kind of tedious, like how can I literally take every action that I make and put it through a filter? And in the beginning, if you're not used to it, it will seem kind of tedious. But once you, as you, be, as you become fluent in natural law, in this occult knowledge, as you become fluent in understanding morality and rights, what happens is these concepts become more and more ingrained in your, in your conditioned state, right? It's not your nature. It's not like you were born knowing this, but your conditioned state now becomes that you really get to, you own this knowledge. You own it and you're applying it. So what happens is that moral filter, which was kind of clumsy in the beginning, it becomes faster and faster until at some point it just becomes second nature, like driving a car. Every, the first time you ever drove a car, it was probably painfully complex, complicated, and awkward, and uncomfortable because of all the things you had to keep track of while you were driving that car. Well, the same thing with a moral filter. In the beginning, it's going to be awkward, but very quickly, just like with learning, mastering driving a car or any other skill, any other kinetic skill that involves mind and body, you'll become better at it. And it's imperative. It can be taught to young children. Young children can begin to learn these concepts. Yes, they can. And it's imperative that we start to help young children to develop that moral filter from as early age as possible so that they have the maximum benefit so that by the time they fully come into their full consciousness and they have all of their higher faculties online, then they already have cultivated a, a strong moral filter and they don't really may not even need further study because it's just it's second nature for them right so this is why it's so important in young children to cultivate this understanding of self-ownership responsibility not harming others not stealing things um, and defending oneself these these can all be taught from a very early age and that's extremely extremely important one last uh nuanced topic here is how do we deal with unrectified wrongs? So obviously we live in a reality where people have free will. That means you or someone else or others, at some point, someone's gonna do a wrong, whether intentionally or otherwise. And this is going to lead to a, a temporary imbalance where there's an injustice, there's a wrong action, there's some harm, some theft, some violence has been committed and there hasn't been any attempt yet to rectify it. So if that goes on in time, if that state or condition of no, not having any resolution keeps going on, we can call that as unrectified wrongs or injustices. It's important to understand that if you are the victim of some wrongdoing, whether or not it's been rectified, you do not get extra rights. 
victims do not get extra rights. And I mention this because there are certain geopolitical movements, without naming any names, that claim that a certain group of victims, because they have some commonality, maybe they're claiming to be victimized in the same way or victimized because of the way they look or the way they act, um, that somehow they get extra rights as a group, as a special interest group. And nothing could be, that is complete bullshit. That's a complete misunderstanding of how rights actually work. However, the individual victim, whether within that group or individually, they do have a right to demand restitution and justice. They do have a right to demand that the wrong, that some kind of compensation occur to correct the imbalance caused by that wrong, by that harm, by that theft. So many times, usually this could involve simply returning something that was stolen. Obviously, that's not always going to be possible. In the case of murder, that's not going to be possible. So there will have to be some other kind of justice. But, and, and that's actually a very deep topic that I'm going to intentionally not dive deep into here because it would literally take the same amount of time or more that I've already taken just to dive into that specific topic. So for now, I will leave it at that and then we can come back to that and study it in more detail. But essentially, there is some kind of compensation that hasn't yet occurred, which can occur, and victims do have a right to demand some compensation, right? So our rights, we may find ourselves temporarily inconvenienced and lose, you know, not being able to exercise certain rights because of the call to seek justice. So the, a very simple example is you have a right to, to travel freely and go on your way without being obstructed. But maybe there's a giant protest going on in the town square and it's so big that it inconveniences you. You're not allowed to, you, not, not that you're not allowed to, but you can't readily pass through the town square. You have to go out of your way. So technically, that group, those individuals that make up that group, they are inhibiting, they're taking away your right. They're preventing you from exercising a natural right. However, they, we can allow them to do that because they are attempting to bring awareness to the fact that there is an injustice that needs to be rectified, right? And so it is a proper temporary suspension of that right in order to call attention to an injustice and try to bring balance and order to that. So that's really the, the, uh, the only time when it is permissible for a being to stop another being from exercising one of their natural born rights um, temporarily. So now we can put it all together. And I know I've covered a lot here. So as I said, I always like agree. I always encourage you to go back and rewatch this video in its entirety, maybe even several times until you can get all the nuance. But let's do a kind of a top level conclusions or summary of what we've learned. So the most important thing to remember is that you have infinite value. You are a being of infinite value and you came here to maximize your evolution, maximize your learning potential and your ability to grow and to experience lessons and and experiences in life. So you express that infinite value, you express that by being free and by making those choices of behavior and you always have the choice. So you don't need anyone's permission. No one, you don't need anyone's permission, neither individuals nor institutions nor pieces of paper in order to act as per your will. You already have that. It's already in nature. And you may do anything you want. You can take your free will and do anything you want except to cause harm to others by stealing their property. Because when you do that, then basically you are suffering. You're only harming yourself and you're also harming those around you because you are increasing the level of suffering in the world. Law, the laws of nature, the natural law is going to ensure that that happens. So you may, you can hurt other people. It is a correct, it is accurate to say that you do have the ability to harm others, but you may do anything you want, any of infinite choices, as long as you don't harm others by stealing their property. The flip side of that is you must, you have an obligation, a moral obligation to 
defend your own property, which includes your life and your, and your mind, your body, as well as your physical property, you must defend it from harm of others. It is your duty to do that. Natural law helps to ensure that when you follow these principles, when you behave rightfully, when you defend yourself, when you're always attempting to do the right thing and so forth, natural law is going to come in and say, great, the more you do that, the more you act rightfully, the more you act morally, here's more freedom. Here's a better reality. Here's more possibilities. And basically the reality opens up and you can experience more and we all can experience more because it's not just the individual because again, we're sharing this reality together so we all gain a benefit together. But also in your own specific life, you will experience certain benefits and less suffering and more prosperity in your own life when you align more with natural law, right? So ultimately acting morally, which is doing the right thing, which is putting your behaviors through a moral filter and attempting to do the right thing more than the wrong as to the greatest extent possible and stopping others from harming you, the more you act that way, the more it leads to freedom in your own life and in the lives of everybody around you. Now, that was a lot to take in and it's a really powerful lesson and obviously it's going to be uh, require perhaps for some people it, you it may require some more reflection um, some perhaps re-watching the video as I mentioned so wisdom is action wisdom doesn't exist just through knowledge and understanding it's the third step of the trivium you have to actually take action I've talked about this many times before so to make this entire lesson more tangible and more real for you I want to encourage you to take action what kind of action can you take? Well, like I said, watching the video multiple times is perfectly acceptable and may be actually very beneficial because oftentimes we don't catch every detail the first time we watch it. It's easy to be distracted. You may want to share this with others because as others learn the same thing, you will then be able to interact with them and, and exchange ideas and validate your understanding of it. By, through conversation with other people, right? You want to work on developing that moral filter that I talked about. So in the beginning, like I said, if you haven't made it your practice to do this, it could be a little awkward, but what you can do is you can test yourself by at the beginning of each day or at the end of each day doing some journaling and then just writing out how you think you did as far as your choices. If you made a wrong choice or something that you realized was wrong, kind of analyze, did you put it through a filter? Um, did you justify it? How did you allow yourself to do that? So that's going to really help you to sharpen the sword or sharpen the pencil of that moral filter. As we talked about self-defense a number of times, it's going to be important for you to begin to cultivate self-defense, both mentally and physically. Remember what I said earlier, the good news is that for the vast majority of cases, simply saying no is enough of defense to stave off a very large number of potential encroachments on your rights and potential to cause harm. So in the vast majority of cases, you won't have to resort to some kind of physical force. But there may be times when you do. So in order to allow yourself to do that, um, you want to be practicing mental self-defense as often as possible. And you want to cultivate a practice of physical self-defense. So maybe learning a martial art, strengthening your body, improving your fitness, improving your nutrition, anything, get, getting better rest so that your mind body is in better shape, so that you're not in fear, so that even if you're not extremely well prepared for a scenario, at least you can bring your best abilities to bear to defend yourself when necessary. So you want to add some kind of practice to your lifestyle if you don't already have it. Um, if you already have a practice, maybe you want to bring new meaning to it or double down on it or, you know, go more deeply into that practice. So I'd love to know if this was helpful, if, this, if you found this to be helpful. If you did, give the video a thumbs up. That's super helpful for me. It, it literally costs you nothing. It takes a, a second to do. And 
but it's extremely helpful to me and actually to more people because what it does is it tells the algorithm on whatever platform you're watching this that, hey, this video has value, please promote it and share it with more people. So all these platforms have an algorithm and when videos receive more likes, it's gonna naturally get promoted to more, more people organically. So do that. Also commenting is an extremely powerful way to really push videos out to a larger audience because again, these algorithms, when someone bothers to leave a comment, which is maybe even less common, then that also tells the algorithm that this video is engagement worthy and it will tend to promote the video for more people. So even if it's just to jump in there and say, thanks David, or great video, or I appreciate it, or just a thumbs up in the comments, even if, if you don't wanna write out a, a statement, that's fine. I love to hear uh, your specific feedback though. So if you have a specific question, or if you have an idea or thought or just some feedback, um, or even constructive criticism, as long as you're not a total hater about it, I'd love to hear about it. Um, all the conversations welcome. You don't even have to necessarily agree with me, you know, because you have free will, but I, I would be very interested to hear your feedback. Um, and that again, makes shows that the video has importance and helps to share with more people. So it increases the engagement. Um, share the video with your network. It really helps get this out to more people. Um, subscribe to my, subscribe to this channel, wherever you're watching this, of course, I forgot to mention that. Um, but also subscribe to my Telegram channel and my group. So the channel is where I push out new video notice notifications. So you can be aware when I publish a new lesson or a new song or a new creation. Um, only about one post a week for now. It's super low volume. So, And then uh, the group is where you can actually interact with other people to talk about what you've been learning. So these are new groups, new groups and channels. Or I should say the channel and the group are new. You'll find links in the... Uh, in the description of the video. If you have been following my work for some time and you've really been getting a lot of value and you wanna help me really take it to the next level and uh, this really helps a lot, you can consider making a donation, even a small amount, uh, it doesn't have to be a big amount. And that helps me to show up more often, to create more content, to help more people and to make this material even better, right? With, with the right technology and the right materials and preparation. So if you're getting a lot of value, make a donation, check out sponsorship. It's a great way to, if you have a product or service um, that you wanna promote a brand and you wanna also help me at the same time as getting some exposure to your brand, then sponsorship's a great way. Super starts off with only $11 a month, super low cost. Um, and it's a win-win because it's essentially a collaboration. Uh, other types of collaboration, I, I, get, I love getting invited on other people's podcasts to kind of reach a new audience, to get the word out to more people. Sometimes uh, I can interview people on my own platform and really just open to other types of collaborations. So if that resonates with you, I'd love for you to reach out. Let me just mention freedomvibe.art academy is what I'm calling this private endeavor, this an educational endeavor and private organization that I have created, right? And this is specifically an academy which is teaching natural law and occult knowledge, um, similar to what we've done on today's video, but in many different ways and forms. So freedomvibe.art academy, this video you're watching is part of the public and free content. So there's always gonna be content that's public and free where I'm teaching these core principles, I'm de-occulting hidden knowledge. It can take the format of songs as well. I do some songwriting. You can see I've already published six songs as of this writing, um, music and art, created by myself and others. Personal development tools, so for example, the seven day challenge is a free public facing tool that you can use to work on your mindset. And there's no cost, it don't, again, it only requires you to take the time to learn how it works and then implement it in your own life and you can get amazing benefits. That's completely free. Like I said, I, I am on podcasts as well and occasionally I do live events and workshops either in person or online as a way to kind of put into practice these principles, so as to exercise them and do exercises to make sure that we improve our understanding and application. So if you wanna go deeper, if you're getting a lot of value and you wanna go in even deeper, then I would recommend the academy enrolling as a student in the academy. As a student in the academy, and this is kind of new, so 
I'll be unveiling more about how it works on my website, so you may want to pay attention there. But basically, as an enrolled student, you're going to get access to a lot of materials that aren't published into the public, right? And you're also, and that includes presentations, coursework, special videos, materials, group events, private coaching with me, consulting, and a lot of materials and exercises that you can use on your own to keep deepening your understanding. So it's all about helping you to free your mind. It's all about helping you to deeply understand and apply principles of natural law and these occulted principles, the science of morality, so that you can experience freedom in your life, so that you can help us experience more freedom in the world and help make the world a better place. So if you're ready to dive in deeper, you may want to consider that. Again, if you go visit my website, freedomvibe.art, you're going to discover a lot more information. There will be the always free to the public materials. So if you're not ready to enroll, that's fine. If it's not for you or not now, that's totally cool. Keep going with the free materials and keep deepening your understanding as much as possible. If you want to reach out to me with questions privately or, or specific ideas for collaboration, go ahead and shoot me an email, david at freedomvibe.art. It's okay to contact me on social media and add me, but anything specific to collaborations, please send me an email. That's where I like to keep track of it. Um, subscribe to my Telegram channel or the group. I know I posted the link there, but it's kind of an awkward link. So in the description of the video, you're going to find the actual links to the group and the channel that you can go ahead and just simply click on them to subscribe or join. And finally, I want to thank you very much for ta having taken this time and having paid attention to what I've shared with you today. And I certainly hope and desire for you that this helps you to create better outcomes in your own life, less suffering, more freedom, more abundance, more prosperity, and helps you to serve and become an even more powerful being and, and to unlock more of your infinite value. So thank you very much. And of course, I will see you very soon.